thank you, first of all, for, for giving me the chance to be here. It's a great pleasure to join you today. Um, that's a very challenging question to, to, to begin. I think the, the, the biggest short-term challenge is probably a, a, a political challenge. We're facing a, a time where the world has a number of very major challenges, economic challenges, social challenges, and we have a political system which is failing to address those. If you look at, at some of the issues that you mentioned, like the election of Donald Trump or Brexit, uh, th this is taking us into a direction which makes dealing with the challenges of inequality and climate change much more difficult. So I think the biggest challenge I see is, is a political challenge. First of all, I, I must agree completely with what Professor Pachari has just said. And the Club of Rome, which has known about this problem, about the risk of climate change for more than 40 years, is now doing exactly the same thing. We've started our, our initiative to, to educate young people. We had our first ever summer academy in Italy a few weeks ago, and we brought lots of young people together to teach them about climate change and to teach them about the economic system which is causing this problem, because it's the economic system that is the cause of climate change. And that, I think, is, goes back to the question about how, how do countries develop? And the book that I wrote with Jürgen Randers looks at how to reform the economic system in the rich world. Now, there, there's no need for growth. We have enough of a big enough economy in the rich world already. We do not need any more economic growth. And so this whole mentality that we need growth in the world is something we need to change. But for the poorer world, we do need economic development. But what we must not do is increase the ecological footprint. We must be able to bring a higher standard of living to people without increasing the carbon footprint and the ecological footprint. And that's really the, 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 the way we need to rethink our economic system in the poor world so that we can improve well-being and standard of living, but not increase the amount of CO2 we pump into the atmosphere. I, I think there's a, there's a need for a note of caution here, uh, without wanting to be controversial. We've got into our heads a number of ideas about the economic system which are fundamentally wrong. That, that, that economic growth is good, that, that it reduces inequality, that it reduces poverty. And we have the same idea with trade. For the last 30 years, we've been told that trade and openness is good. But actually, if I look at the countries that I travel to around the world, if I go to, to, to Southeast Asia, or I go to Africa, or I go to Latin America, you see a lot of countries adopting the Western model of economic development with open markets, but it doesn't mean they're able to compete in anything other than resource extraction. That you can sell your resources because there are lots of people who want to buy it, the rich countries, but to compete economically on anything that requires economies of scale with open markets becomes almost impossible. I was in Indonesia a few months ago, and they would like to develop a, an automotive industry or a chemicals industry or a steel industry, and they can't do that because of open markets. So I think we've got into our head the idea that complete openness is, is good, and I think that's something we need to rethink, that we need to have balance in our, in our openness of trade so that other countries, poorer countries, can actually develop the economic foundations for future, future development and not just have their, their resources taken uh, in, in, in over a period of maybe 20 years. So I think we need to rethink this whole idea about openness to trade. The, obviously a country which, which has a, a major conflict is going to put investors, make investors nervous. Um, so, I, you know, clearly, Mr. Wagner's right. I mean, the war is an issue which we haven't discussed and, and, and is, an, is certainly a theme for, for business development uh, in the country. I, my other response, though, to, to what the Prime Minister said was that he wants to be on the side of business, that he wants to privatize, that he wants to have a digital economy, and that he wants to focus on growth. And I, I thought, I understand why he says that, but it's a very, it's a very traditional way of thinking. In, in the West, if, if you look at what happened after the Second World War, growth led to a huge level of, of improvement and well-being. Economic growth and well-being went up together. But in the last 30 years, that hasn't happened. We've seen economic growth, but we've actually seen the gap between rich and poor increasing. We've seen poverty in much of the world increasing. Uh, we've seen joblessness going up. The number of people without a job has gone up despite all the economic growth. And so 
we need to rethink this, this, this very basic narrative that we've got, this very basic idea that economic growth is always going to lead to progress, that, that, that if, we, if we're open to business, that's always going to lead to progress. We need to have a much more uh, nuanced, balanced objective, which is to improve the standard of living of people and to do that within the bounds of nature. It's not terribly difficult. It just takes a different way of thinking to, to, to develop different economic policies which are more inclusive and more sustainable. And that, I think, was the, was the, 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 the concern I had with the, the speech we heard this morning on growth. We, we've got into our heads the idea, I think, that innovation is about technology. It's about companies like Google and Amazon and Tesla. And, and to a great extent, that we don't need innovation in, in that technological sense at all to solve the world's problems. We don't need innovation in the energy sector. We have all the solutions to the world's energy challenges already. Where we need innovation is in our social and economic systems, particularly the economic system. The, the, the economic system, we need to ask some fundamental questions about what is the economy for? Who is it serving? What do we want to achieve with it? That's where we need innovation, and also in, in the way our political systems respond to the needs of the people. We need to be, give much more thought to that, not to just to technology. And I also just want to make the point that I, 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 the Club of Rome and, and I are not against economic growth. We can have as much economic growth as we like. We can have growth in the services sector, growth in the care sector, growth in, in social, social entrepreneurialism. We can have economic growth but we must not increase the ecological footprint. That's the really important part. We mustn't continue to damage the environment by producing greenhouse gases, which then create climate change. And that's where we've got our thinking wrong right, right now. That we think we have to have economic growth, which requires more, more, more resources to be used, which creates more energy to be used, which causes greenhouse gases. So our economic growth desire is the cause of climate change. And that's what we've got to break. We can have economic growth, we can increase the amount of GDP we have, but we must not increase the amount of CO2, methane, and other greenhouse gases that we produce. And that's where we've got to make the, the break in thinking, and that's where we need innovation. The main piece of advice I would give is do not just follow the economic system that has been successful in the West in the last 30 years. Think laterally. Think about a new economic system which is more inclusive. Don't assume that growth brings jobs. Don't assume that growth will reduce inequality. Don't assume that growth will reduce poverty. Don't just think that small government is necessarily good. Don't let business regulate itself. Don't think trade should be entirely open. Question all of those assumptions. Don't think that innovation should just be in the technological sector. Come up with a new economic system which is fit for the future, not one which is fit for the past. Victor, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think just picking up with what Professor Reinhardt said, we need to change what we're measuring, uh, and we need to change our economic system, and we need to redefine work. Let me also start with, with the limits to growth and, and try and explain where we're coming from. The limits to growth has, has a number of scenarios in it about the future. It looks at 200 years of, of human development, and you can see perhaps the most famous chart from it here, which shows what we were anticipating. So this is from 1900 through to 2100. And it looks at a number of key measures. It looks at industrial output, it looks at food output, population, uh, the pollution level, and the use of non-renewable resources. The first uh, vertical line you can see, the dotted line, is in 1972 when the report was published. And the report was done by a, a team of scientists at MIT. And they said that if we carry on increasing the human ecological footprint at the current rate as we were doing in the early 1970s, then the system would collapse. It would enter a crisis around 2030. Now, the other vertical line is where we are today. Now, when a human system collapses, when a complicated system collapses, it doesn't happen quickly. It doesn't happen over six months or six years. It happens over decades. Now, we would argue that that process of collapse is underway, that the financial crisis, that climate change, that the migration problems, the political problems that we're having are all signs that the human system that we've built for so long is beginning to fall apart. Dennis Meadows, who was one of the authors of Limits to Growth, 
and I was with him two weeks ago in Budapest, says that it's too late for sustainable development. So when we talk about sustainable growth and sustainable development, to some extent we're trying to do something which cannot be done. Now why does he say that? Because today we live as if we had 1.6 planets. Where I live in Switzerland, we live as if we have four planet Earths. In the United States, they live as if they have five planet Earths. We're living beyond the capacity of nature. And because of that, we have problems like climate change, we have excess resource use, we have the pollution of the seas and the oceans, and we have all the other social problems because we're living beyond the bounds of nature. So what we need to do is manage our economic systems to bring them back into balance. Why, why do we have this problem? Why do we have this situation where we've, we've increased our ecological footprint to an unsustainable level? Well, there are probably three reasons. One is population growth. When I was born in 1960, there were three billion people on the earth. Today, there are 7.6 billion people on the earth. And we're increasing the human population by around 100 million a year. The second reason is the short-termism, short that we think about the, the short-term issues much more than we think about the long-term issues. We're focused on, on, on increasing profits every three months, not on the danger of climate change, which will ultimately kill millions of us unless we do something to stop it. The third reason is our economic system. And I, I, you know, I, I put this, this picture up of The Economist. I used to write for The Economist, and, and now I'm not so proud that I did, because it, it encourages us to think about an economic system which is focused on GDP, focusing on growth. We focus on that because we think it is going to improve well-being. We think it's going to create jobs. We think it's going to reduce inequality. We think it's going to, re to lift six billion people out of poverty. We have this mental map in our heads that says growth is good, that free trade is good, that the environment doesn't matter, and that small government is essential. And all of this thinking is wrong. All of this thinking has led us to this problem and led us to this mentality of this little rabbit on the side that says, I want more all the time. So we have this short-term mentality that makes us think that a new iPhone and a, a smart new car and higher quarterly profits is somehow good. But in the long term, we're doing a huge amount of damage. We're creating this, this vast increase in population. We're creating this migration problem by increasing the <coughs> level of the gap between rich and poor. We see the rate of growth per head declining. We see happiness stagnant. And we see that we're plundering the world's resources. So we have something which is fundamentally unsustainable in the long term but seems to be okay in the short term. What are the solutions? Well, I mean, when Victor gave the introduction, that's what, that's what the book that I've written with Jürgen Randers, who is one of the other authors to Limits to Growth, is about. How do we find solutions to shift the economic system onto a, a better, healthier path? Now, this is actually written for the rich world. We've, we've, we've focused on Europe, the US, and Japan, about how we can shift the economic system there. And we've We've suggested things like sharing jobs by shortening the working year so that the benefits of digitalization are spread more evenly and the gap between rich and poor is decreased. About taxing fossil energy much, much more to increase the incentives for a shift to a more sustainable energy system and to also to redistribute wealth. To restrict trade when it's necessary because trade should be to the benefit of the majority not just a few big corporations. To tax businesses and the rich more, and to provide a minimum income for those who need it. Now, a lot of the, these, these ideas are not suitable in somewhere like Ukraine or, or in much of the poor world where different economic thinking is required. But what I'm trying to say in this, in this book and what I'm trying to say today is do not adopt the system of the West. Do not adopt the system which is focused just on GDP growth and open trade because all it will result in is the rich getting richer and your resources being plundered. You'll end up without the means of economic development in the long term if you adopt that system. 
adopt a system which has got a broader measure of progress, which serves the majority of people in the long term, and which is much more sustainable for the environment. Thank you. You, you, can, you can increase your, your economic financial wealth very simply and very quickly by selling, selling your resources. I mean, you can sell your forests, you can sell your wheat, and you can raise lots of money. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, about raising the well-being, raising the standard of living of people. And that requires uh, a different approach to work, I think, a redefinition of what work is, and a different approach to, to, to the distribution of the income you get from selling resources. When it comes to investment, it also requires some protection. I, I mean, uh, we heard before about China. I mean, China has been a huge success, arguably unique, although there are countries that have followed similar paths in the last 50 years, Taiwan, Japan, uh, Korea, they've been successful because they protected local industries. They protected their businesses and allowed them to grow. So if you're going to get the wealth you could, which you can get quickly from selling your resources, you have to invest it in something and then protect that, whatever it is you invested in. And that's what I say about not being completely open to trade. You have to protect your assets, allow them to grow and develop, and then you can bring down the trade barriers. But don't just think that you can, you can compete with China in manufacturing, or you compete with, 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 with Europe in banking or services with the small scale that you've got. You can't. The only way you can do that is by protecting them. So, so if, if, you, if you create wealth, nurture it. I think that's the main message. Nurture what you've got and let it grow. Don't let it be squandered. We've, we've got something a bit like the need for a, a, a Copernican moment. Because today we, we have a belief a bit like the world is flat. We have this belief that GDP growth is going to help, that small government is good, that less regulation is good, that openness to trade is good. And this mentality has become fixed in our heads. And it, it's by design. I mean, there was a group called the Mont Pelerin Society, which started in the late 1940s which fed into universities and educational institutions and to think tanks, which has got us all thinking in this, this neoliberal free market way that that's the answer to all our problems. And what it does is it makes the rich rich. Now, we need to, we need to ha ha have some fundamental rethinking about this whole approach. And we need, for a start, to have a strong state. If you look at the, the gap between rich and poor, when it began to shrink, the only time that it really shrank in the 20th century was after the Second World War, where the gap between rich and poor got smaller. Now, we had a free market system then, we had a capitalist system, but we also had a strong state, a state which acted as a balancing mechanism, which restricted the activities of big corporations, which looked after the benefits of the majority. That's what we need again, something which is more balanced, which is more in keeping with a sustainable, more environmentally protective, more equal society. So if you want to have any message to your government is think about balance. Don't just think about pushing hard on the GDP accelerator because that will result in a very divided medieval society. Uh, we're, we're entering something like a fourth, a fourth stage of, of, of development in terms of industrial development. The first stage was agriculture and then came the industrial revolution which started in England and then spread to, to the United States and the rest of Europe. And, and we were able to make a huge increase in productivity, which lets economic growth comes from productivity, Jonathan, what Jonathan was talking about. The next stage was to move from the Industrial Revolution into the Services Revolution, which, which took place in the second half of the, of the 20th century. And today, we're moving into an era where there's going to be this mass digitalization, as, as Jonathan talked about. Now, that's very seductive, and it sounds very appealing, that we can, we can suddenly digitize everything, and there's lots of growth opportunities there. And it will boost productivity dramatically. And higher productivity will lead to lots of growth. But that will be very good for business. That will be very good for GDP. It will not be good for society, unless the benefits of that digitization, unless the benefits of that increase in productivity are shared and redistributed. It will also not be good for employment. If you look at companies like Google or Amazon or, or, or Tesla, 
They have a fraction of the number of employees that companies like Volkswagen or the Indian Railways or Toyota or the post office have. So again, you need to rethink employment with the digitization. And the jobs that will be left are those which are in care, looking after other people, cutting hair, playing in orchestras, jobs which cannot be mechanized. So my recommendations are, first of all, protect. Protect what you've got. Protect the industries and the jobs that you have. Secondly, redistribute so that the benefits of digitization, the benefits of the new wave of economic development are shared across society. Focus on services, care, and IT, and redefine what we mean by work, so that you include many more people into the economy, mothers that look after children, people that look after the elderly, and pay these people a wage so that everybody can benefit from the revolution that's about to take place. Thank you so much. Thank you.